Good morning, my name is Paige Lockaby and I've been attending Hope for six years. Please stand for today's reading. Our passage today is Judges 11, four through 11. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives me gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went to the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be seated. Good morning. Uh, it's great to see you today. Thank you for being here as we continue our study through the book of Judges together. Next week, uh, just to let you know, we start the Judge Samson. Samson is the last judge in our series through Judges as well. And it will take us uh, about three to four weeks or so to get through Samson, a great, uh, interesting individual with a lot of information to share there. So I encourage you to be ready for that and start reading about Samson as well. But today, Jephthah, I call him an Old Testament pirate, is what I call him, an Old Testament pirate. Can all of us in unison do this? Everybody go, ar. Everybody do that for a moment. Ah, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, it kind of helps you to understand Jephthah for a moment. So let me, before I talk about Jephthah, give you a state of the nation of Israel and where they are at this moment in the narrative. It's Judges chapter 10, verse 6 is where we'll start today. So grab your Bible, your devices, and follow along this morning. Also, the words are on the screen. It says, the Lord of Israel again. That's a word that we hear a lot in the book of Judges the word, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So I go back to this statement this morning, did what was evil in the sight of of the Lord, we have heard that statement very specifically worded like that now for the sixth time in the life of Israel. And what have they done? Well, they've done the same thing that they continue to do as we study every judge together, and that is they have brought into the nation of Israel the gods of the surrounding nations, but not just the gods or the idols. But I think we have to understand what's happening in the life of Israel. They brought into the nation the practices of worship of those idols as well. They brought in the sexual practices, which many times was what is involved in worship of these gods as well. And also, historians would tell us that Israel has gone as far as to bring in human sacrifice, specifically the sacrifice of children. That is extremely important in understanding the life of Jephthah as we read later on about one of the worst decisions, if not the worst decision, that he ever makes in his life. And along with these idols become the practice of these idols of worship as well. And so in all of this and what Israel is doing, they still acknowledge God. And I think this is interesting. And, and this is the part that we can connect with in a moment. They still acknowledge God as Jehovah, that of being, that he is the creator God and the supreme being. Yet they've mixed all these other idols into their worship rituals and rhythms. They have lived so close to the rest of the world around them is what's happened. Because if you remember when we started this, this book, that when Joshua brought Israel to the promised land, God made a very specific command over them. And that command was that they were to rid 
or remove all of the idol-worshiping nations in the promised land. And if they could not remove them, then they were to annihilate them in that way. And so what Israel did, thinking they know better than God, they thought, well, what better than to make friends with those nations and to live as next-door neighbors to them as well. So I go back to the statement, and that is that they live so close to the rest of the world around them that the practices of these idols, the worshiping of these idols of these nations around them become second nature to Israel. And I thought about this a lot this week, that you live close enough and long enough to something in this world, it will become a part of you. It will become a part of you. The text says that God sold Israel to the Ammonites. I think that's a very interesting word that is used in the text as well, that God gives them over to the Ammonites because of their disobedience to bring them back to him. But when I read this text, what I realized is that they've been enslaved by the Ammonites, yet they pray to the Ammonite gods for deliverance. I think that's a very interesting thought, is that they've been enslaved by the Ammonites, yet they pray to the Ammonite gods for deliverance of the nation of Israel. Why? Because it has become so ingrained into who they are. And so I wrote in my journal this week that you live with idols long enough, you will become enslaved to them. And then you will reach out to the very thing that has enslaved you to bring you freedom. And that's exactly what they do. So if we're going to talk about idols, then I have to start with a question. What is our biggest idol in life? What is our biggest idol as humans? Well, let me answer that for you very quickly. And that is, it's ourselves. It is plainly ourselves. It is to fulfill me. It is about my flesh. And when the Bible talks about flesh, it's not necessarily talking about just skin. But he's talk, it's talking about our sinful nature, the sinful humanity of our life that desires gratification, as many writers would say, over the glory of God. What they mean is this, that I am the point of life and not God. And when that leaves you and I unfulfilled in this world, where do we turn to first? We turn to ourselves. We adjust something. We acquire something else. We enter a relationship. We do something to try to fix what is broken within our lives as well. So we simply live under this premise of more of me results in a better version of me. Wow. More of me results in a better version of me. You say, but wait, Mark, I don't have any statues in my house, right? You know, there, there are no idols in my house. I don't have any, any statues of Baal or, or Ashtorah. Ashtoreth is actually the, the graven image, the pole itself, but Ashtoreth is the goddess. And, and have you ever wondered why when you read through the Old Testament that Baal and Ashtoreth are mentioned so many times together? Well, I want to tell you why, because can, I think it gives us an indicator of where Israel has sank to in their relationship with God because of their close proximity to the world and the idol nations they live around. That as Torah is actually the mother of the god Baal, but also she is Baal's mistress at the same time. Now let that settle in your heart and in your mind for a moment, right? And that shows you where they have sank to as well. And here is what an idol is. And if you're wondering, so I can kind of define it for you this morning, here is what an idol is. An idol in your life is anything, and I capitalize the word anything, that is regarded as equal to or greater than God. And I think, leave that up for a moment, because I think many times that we dismiss ourselves from the conversation because we say, listen, I have not put anything greater than God in my life. I have not put anything above God in my life. I know who he is. I understand that he's the creator and the sustainer of the world. So I have not done that. But I think what we have missed a great part of this definition of what an idol actually is in our life. And that is that is anything that is equal to God. It is anything in my life that I have said this brings me great fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment and I place it on the same plane with God, that is an idol in your life. Wow. 
you don't, you don't get a lot of amens when you talk about idols, right? Isn't that true? Yes, it's just not going to happen, and I don't expect it, and I understand that. But I think when we put ourselves in this definition now, that it's anything that is regarded as equal to or greater than God, then I ask this question to you this morning. What are you loving equally or more than you are loving God? That's huge. Because you can kind of sit here for a moment and do an inventory of your life and you can kind of begin to plug things in to the blank. So that question that what are you loving today within your life that is equal to or, or that is greater than how you are loving God? Because what we love becomes what is important. What we love is where we spend our time and our resources and what we give our hearts to and what brings ultimate fulfillment and joy and power within our lives. And it's a problem for us. It is. John, in the book of 1 John, Chapter 5, a small book, but he ends the book by saying this to us. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. If it were not a problem for those that love God, those that call themselves believers, if it were not a problem to us, then he would have never started out the statement by calling us little children. It refers to us. So here's what I would ask you to do this morning. Write yourself back into the narrative of Jephthah. Put yourself back in there. See the fingerprints of your life throughout the things that we're going to talk about this morning. Don't dismiss yourself from the story. So here's an idle test for you today. Are you ready? Here it is. It's a question again. And it says that if I took, the question starts out, if I took away everything else in your life but Jesus, would he be enough? How would you answer that? If I had the ability to remove everything from your life, everything that you love and hold dear in, in this world, then would Christ be enough for you? I think that's the idol test. That's the litmus test of our life that we have to give ourselves, perhaps on a daily basis, to check this up, to make sure that God is in the right place and the right priority of my life every day. Because I'll tell you what, the closer you live to the world, Understand this, as Israel did, the easier it is for those things to slip into your life and they equate themselves with God in your life. Because sin and idolatry are not just a rejection of God. No, it's also a replacement of God. It's not that... that Israel has rejected God necessarily. No, they still pray to him. They still understand who he is. They still have all of that. And I'm not saying that to you at all, that you have rejected God. I'm not even saying to you that you don't love God. That's, that's not the debate at all. But you have replaced him as your ultimate joy and fulfillment in this life. Wow. So what does Israel do? Look at, look at verse 15. It's what it says. And the people of Israel said to the Lord that we have sinned, do to us whatever seems good to you. I think they're on the right track, right? It sounds good. But look what they say right after that. Only please deliver us this day is what they say to the Lord. So they put away the foreign gods from among them, served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. He has waited 20 years on them. If you do the math and look back historically, he's waited 20 years. Wow. You and I become frustrated if it takes us more than two minutes for our chicken sandwich at the Christian Chicken. Isn't that right? True. Yes. Like, oh, they have failed here. Wait. I'm sorry. You know? And, and Because it's always their pleasure. Correct? Isn't that right? True. Yes. But he has waited 20, if you have ever wondered about the character and the nature of God and how loving and long-suffering and how merciful he is, he has waited 20 years and he brings the Philistines and the Amorites to eat away at the nation of Israel because he loves them. And Israel finds themselves not necessarily in repentance at first, but what they find themselves in is regret. Listen, regret and repentance are not the same thing. 
They are not the same thing. God responds to repentance. It's a turning in your life. It's a transformation of your life. Regret is that you are sorrowful for the situation and the pain that you find yourself in because of your sin. I understand that. I get that completely. But they are vastly different. Yet it appears that they repent. They put away their idols. But when they said this statement to God that we've sinned, do to us whatever seems good to you, that should have been the end of the story and that should have been it. God, we repent, we are broken, we understand our lives and what we've done, so God, you just do whatever you want to with us. And this helps us to understand the way that Israel navigates the rest of this narrative. It does, because they prepare for war. They go to a place called Mizpah with an army. And they have this army ready to fight the Ammonites. And all of a sudden, somebody raises their hand. And someone says, I see that hand, right? Yes. And, and they say, my question is, where's our leader? We don't have a leader. We have an army. We have an enemy. But we don't have a, we don't have a leader here. And so what does God do? God raises up a judge, this unlikely hero for this moment in the life of Israel, yet what is so different about Jephthah than all the other, many of the other judges is that here the people initiate this judge, but God allows it. I think it's very interesting. So Judges chapter 11, verse one. I'm getting to Jephthah. Hang on, okay? Just, just give me a minute. Giving you some understanding of what's going on. It says that now Jephthah, the... the um, the, the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was a son of a prostitute. So Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in your father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And then Jephthah fled with his brothers, lived in the land of Tob, with, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Sort of sounds like Abimelech last week in some ways, but yet very different. So the question is, who is Jephthah, and why should we spend time getting to know him? He is the embodiment of the definition of a judge, is what he is. He's this unlikely hero God uses for this allotted time in the life of Israel. He's not a king like Abimelech tried to be, and we saw what happened to him, that he got the eternal headache, right, from the millstone dropping from the tower. So it's not that, but he's a warrior. He's a deliverer. He's a rescuer. In fact, most of the Old Testament judges are types and shadows of that of Christ, and the redemptive story around them is a, is a type and a shadow of our redemption as well. And what we see throughout the book of Judges, which I love so greatly, that it is painted with this broad brush of the gospel and mercy. Jephthah is rejected by his own people, by his own family, forced to leave. He finds community with worthless men where he becomes what I call a pirate is what he becomes. And when I say that, all of a sudden you think that Jephthah looks like Jack Sparrow, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, you kind of got that picture of, of, of him as well. He's living in Tob like Robin Hood and his merry men. But before you draw a lot of conclusions and we go on, can I just show you something about what God does in Jephthah's life and then we work our way backward a bit? It's the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. Because you see, Jephthah makes some very poor decisions. And we see how the world has crept into his life as well. But yet in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32, we find these words and it says this. And what more shall I say? For time would fail to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and of David and of Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, 
escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. I love this because why, Mark? Because there is a pirate listed in the Faith Hall of Fame. It's right there. There he is with all the others. I'm excited. It gives me great hope. Why? Because God can and will use people like me. And God can and will use people like you. Isn't that powerful? It's hopeful for you and I. It is. Yes. So you have met the person next to you. Would you, you know this is coming, right? You turn to the person next to you this morning. Could you say to them, God can and will use people like me and end the statement with "r" like a pirate. Could you do that for a moment? Ah. You can't tell me at some point in life you want to grow up to be a pirate, right? Yes. So, I'm so encouraged by this because I think what we're about to read about Jephthah is going to help some of you settle into this understanding of the character and the nature of God and how merciful he is in our lives and how that he works in and through us, even in our great dysfunction and sometimes really bad theology. So it's verse four. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel, and when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob and said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? I would have said the very same words. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have come to you now. (laughs) It's kind of funny, isn't it? That you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, and this is one of the more important statements of all of the text, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. It is a declarative statement that he makes. So I wrote in the margins of my notes this week, rescue and reign. They go together. Rescue and reign. Verse 10, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us. If we do not do this, you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all these words before the Lord at Mizpah. So here's a couple of thoughts this morning. You cannot fully reverence God or repent before God and fail to submit to his rule over your life. Listen to this. That you cannot fully reverence God or repent before God and fail to submit to his rule over your life. Let me give you some context for a moment about this conversation because there's so many many shadows of how God works and how we work in our relationship with God here in this conversation with Gilead and, and the men of Gilead and Jephthah. That after they exiled him, because he's a son of a prostitute, that he's not good enough to, for them to follow until they find themselves faced with all the misery of the Ammonites. And it's such a type and a shadow of, of our relationship with God so many times that when the men of Gilead are in trouble, then they need Jephthah. But when life is wonderful, Jephthah can stay in tobe with his merry men is what he can do. I think we're meant to see some things for you and I to understand this morning. As with Jephthah, so it is with God. Rescue and reign go hand in hand. Here is the thought that I want God to rescue me, but do I want God to have rule over me? I want God to rescue me, but do I, do I want him to have rule over me? It's a question of lordship. It's a struggle for all of us. 
that we vacillate in and out of these moments with God, don't we? Of surrendering areas of our life to him and lordship of our life to him. I want God to redeem me, yes. I want God to save me from eternal punishment. Man, nobody wants to get in the line to go to hell. Nobody wants in that line. But do I want to surrender the lordship and the headship and the throne and the control of my life to him? Because true repentance that of a spiritual transformation within my life and submission to God's rule of my life are inseparable. Realize that. That I cannot say that I have truly repented before God if I have not surrendered my life to the lordship of him over me. Wow, those are tough words. I realize that. And that may be somewhat of a bitter medicine to swallow for some of us in this room this morning. And I hope it gets you to think and to look at your life as well. Because here is the thought. You can't have Jephthah whip up on the Ammonites and he not become your judge. That just doesn't work like that. You can't have Jephthah the warrior without having Jephthah the judge ruling you. And how many times in our life with the Lord and our relationship with him do we work in and out of these areas of our life that we come to God and we're broken, yes, and God, I repent, and God, I give, my, I give this to you and I give my life to you. Lord, I surrender this relationship. Lord, I surrender this, this habit, this addiction of mine. God, I, I give it to you. And then we walk away thinking, Job done, it's complete. And what we realize is that reign and rule always go together. Understand our rescue and reign always go together. And so what we follow that up with is this submission of our life and everything about us to the lordship of Christ. So what are you holding back? Wow, who are you holding back? What relationship are you holding back? What habit, what addiction are you holding back today and you're not submitting that to the lordship of Christ? So Jephthah calls this meeting with the Ammonite king for diplomacy. I'll give you some context in a moment of all of this. But he says to avoid war and to really avoid the thing that God commands Israel to do. Let's talk this out And let's see if we can come to an agreement here. Isn't that the way we try to work our lives sometimes? Even with God and the things of our life that have broken the heart of God as well. And so I read Judges 11 in verse 24. That's one verse in that conversation that Jephthah has with this Ammonite king. And man, it just said something to me, verse 24. It says, will you not possess what? Shemash, which is the God or one of the gods of the Ammonites, will you not possess what Shemash, your God, gives you to possess? Jephthah says that to this king. And all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Here's the thought. And I want you to let this sink deep into your heart today. That if you live close to the world long enough, the spirit of the world will find a place in your life. Because when I read verse 24, man, it it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You know what that statement means? That southern for God spoke to me is what that is. It really is, yes. It hit me like a ton of bricks. That Jephthah, in his wisdom, is trying to use diplomacy with this Ammonite king. That this fight is over land. Israel says this belongs to us. The Ammonites said no, it belongs to us. And so what Jephthah does is very capably gives them a a history lesson. And he's very accurate in the things that he says to the Ammonite king. But diplomacy fails. And then Jephthah makes this statement. If Shamash gives you land, and I paraphrase, then... Wouldn't you possess it? The same thing with our God, he says. We should possess what he gives us as well. Here's what he does. He equates Shemash with Jehovah. 
is what he does. He's trying to be relevant, Mark. Come on, give the guy a little break. He's trying, but he's trying to be relevant. Yes, maybe, maybe that's true, but at the expense of truth. Here's what he's saying, bro, you do you, we'll do me, you know, and we'll do us, and then we'll all kind of be happy and everything will be good. And that's not what God said for them to do at all from the very beginning. That's not it. The whole problem with Israel started with that kind of understanding. Here is the thought. If you live close enough to the things of the world long enough, the world has a way of creeping into your life. It does. And it will come out at some point. And it will come out in how you think and how you talk and how you reason like the world reasons. He says, hey, do, you know, you, you guys just do you Believe what you want, we'll do us, believe what we want. And there is a fundamental problem there as he has validated their God in some way. Because remember, sin is not just a rejection of God, but it is as much a replacement of God. It is. Have you ever read the Ten Commandments? You say, Mark, come on, you insult us, right? Yeah, have you ever, well, look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse three. Let me read that commandment to you for a moment. That you shall have no other gods before, beside the word before, write the word besides. Same word. You shall have no other gods before or besides me is what the text says to you and I. You see, Jephthah is not actively wor- worshiping Shemash. No, that's that, and, but that's not what the command says. But it is equating, and that's the problem here. It's how the spirit of the world around you and I, the brokenness and the sinfulness of this world, creeps into our lives in a very subtle and a very unassuming way. That, that I am ultimately trusting in something that is equal to God. I haven't turned my back on God. I have not renounced God, but I've equated something in this life that I'm entrusting in equally for the joy and the fulfillment and the peace of my life. And that doesn't just happen one morning when you wake up and you find yourself there thinking like the, the spirit of the world or, or reasoning like the spirit of the world as that we find Jephthah doing. No, it's after you have lived in Tob for a long enough time that the world has crept into your life. You say, Mark, this is not the sermon we came for this morning, right? This is not it. Listen, I want to tell you, you can't preach Jephthah without it being rough. I'm just going to tell you that, right? Right up to the front. Because, and, and can I tell you, to reach down and to put on your spiritual seatbelt, because it gets worse, all right? I'm just going to just give you that right up front in, in great love. But it comes together in, in great encouragement for you and I. So just, just hang on for a moment and, and stay Stay in the seat because everything that we have talked about thus far gives you some kind of understanding and criteria to process what we're about to read because we're about to read some text that has been puzzling to theologians for hundreds of years about what Jephthah is about to do, but it helps you to understand how he has the mindset that he has, and and in order to understand him, helps you to kind of understand why you should never go here yourself. So what does Jephthah do? Verse 29, then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. That is important. You need to understand that. We've seen that before on other judges. The spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. He passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites, and Jephthah made a vow. The worst decision of his life, 
he made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. What a lame brain, numb skull, whatever else you want to say, knuckle-headed thing that he did, right? Yes. What did he expect to come out of his house? I don't know. It would have been great if it was the house cat, right? I don't know, right? Correct? This is just a joke, okay? Sorry, all the cat lovers, you love me anyway. You have to deal with it. So here's the deal. But I think it helps you to understand all the things that we've said about how you live close to the world, how the things of the world creep into your life, how the reasoning of the world creeps into your life helps us to understand what is about to happen because this has baffled Bible students for hundreds of years. Here is the thought. Let me read the text to you. And Jephthah has a strong faith. He has a strong faith, no doubt, in God, but some very weak theology. Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to him with the tambourines and with the dance. Remember the vow. The first thing that comes out of his house, he sacrifices as a burnt offering. She was his only child. This is written so that you will feel the intensity of the pain of, of Jephthah's life. She was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. You see how the Bible just repeats it, so you get the point. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes, and he said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have come... You have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back what I vowed. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. Strong faith in God, yes. But weak theology. What do you mean by that? What I mean is this, that Jephthah sought to earn something from God that God had already freely given him. Was it the years in Tob where the spirit of the world around him and the idol worshipers seeped into his life? I don't know. But it's why here at Hope Fellowship from this stage that we teach almost constantly and consistently week to week on the character and the very nature of God why? So that you don't find yourself trying to attempt to manipulate God like he's Shamash into doing something he's already done for you freely because he loves you. Do you see that? You see, some theologians try to soft pedal this verse somewhat and, and they, they try to, to say, now, he, he didn't sacrifice his daughter at all, but what he did was that he gave his daughter to the temple for her to serve there in celibacy because the text talks a lot about her virginity, not knowing a man and not having a child, much like a young woman would enter a convent to become a nun. And as well intended as those thoughts are, it and I'm going to say this, and if you don't like it, then, you know, send me an email or whatever. But it, but it castrates the text is what it does. It's like having a lion with no teeth and no claws. It looks the part and it sounds the part, but it just can't get the business done. Exegetically, if you look at the text, Jephthah sacrificed his only daughter. He, he killed her and he burnt her body on a vow that he never had to make, nor would he have had to kept that vow at all. But he did all of this because he lacked an understanding of God's character, and nature. 
the victory over the Ammonites was always a sovereign and absolute work of God. It's why the scripture said that the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. It was upon him. And so it was an absolute sovereign work of God on behalf of a nation that deserved none of it, that they didn't deserve God's help at all. But this is all about mercy and love. This is about the gospel for you and I. Because as you slowly adopt the ways of the world, the truths of the gospel in our lives become more glossed over in our understanding. Who's ever playing better come and play because Mark will keep talking if you don't, right? So. Do you, do you understand that thought? That the closer we live to the world, the closer we allow the reasoning and the thoughts and the philosophies and the ways of the world to creep into our lives, the more glossed over our understanding of God and his ways and his nature and his character become to where we find ourselves in these moments doing things we never thought possible for us to do, things that break our own heart, all the while in the middle of all of that, we still say that we love God. Because sin is not just rejecting God, but it's replacing God in our lives. Oh. I woke up this morning like at 2 a.m. And I'm an early riser person but 2 a.m. is not my thing, right? And I looked at the clock and I felt like it was time to get up, but it wasn't time to get up. Five o'clock is when I do that on Sunday mornings. And so I laid there and couldn't sleep. And so I began to re-preach this text in my mind. And I said that to myself, put yourself in the shoes of Jephthah at that moment. Put yourself there. What he must have felt like, the pain, the agony in his life with a vow that he should never made because God had already given a promise and a vow he did not have to keep because he had no understanding of God's mercy and grace and his nature, his character. And that's not a license for you to go break every promise that you make in life. Don't run with that. I, you know, got to put that out there, right? But what I realize is, as I lay there this morning, that one of the most dangerous things we can do as a believer and a Christ follower is to sometimes see how close we can live to the world and the reasoning and the thoughts and the philosophy and the ways that the world does business and try to maintain the proper heading and bearing in our life of who God is and how God works and of God's character and nature and mercy and grace in my life. And the first thing that we lose sight of is the gospel. It's God's unmerited love and favor on you and I. And we try to earn something that God has freely given us. And that, my friend, is a road for disaster in our life. We forget Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. For by grace, listen, that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. 
Paul says. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You live in Tob long enough. You'll allow the ways of Tob to creep into your life. And you'll find yourself doing things you never thought you would do. So before we pray, let me say this to you this morning. As a theological clarification, the text never implies that God is pleased with what Jephthah does with his daughter. Never. In fact, Torah is very clear on human sacrifice. Deuteronomy 18 and 10, there shall be found among you or shall not be found among you anyone who burns his sons or his daughters in an offering. I think it's very interesting how specifically it talks about children there. It's a struggle to say that you and I love God, and I'm not here to debate that with you, but to say that we love God and not desire a greater understanding of his character and nature. Because what we read in this story is a powerful story of rejection and human ambition, a love for God, foolishness, victory, heartache, ignorance, catastrophic failure, unimaginable loss, great mercy, grace, acceptance, restoration, and redemption. God says to you and I, as a way of hope and encouragement this morning. In the book of Hebrews, again, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson. And here's the pirate of the Old Testament, Jephthah, of David, king of Israel, and Sam, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fair, fire, escaped the edge of the sword. But look at what the writer says. We're made strong out of weakness. God loves pirates like us. He does. In the moments of our dysfunction and brokenness, in the bad decisions that we make, the wrong turns in life, the massive foul ups, God loves people like us to the point. He said, I want to prove it to you. And I'm going to put one of them right here in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11 to settle any doubt of my character and nature. So some of you have made grave mistakes. Some of you have made wrong turns in life. Maybe not in comparison to Jephthah, but you understand the ideas here. And God says to you today, through understanding his character and nature and who he is, he loves you. To the point that he sent his son Jesus, who you did not deserve and I did not deserve, to be wrapped in flesh, live this life as you and I live without sin, die on a cross, buried in a barred grave, and on the third day, he kicked the door in and defeated our greatest enemy. Wrap your mind around who God is today. 
and it will help you in some of these ways when you find yourselves in situations like Jephthah. So can I pray with you for a moment this morning? That you would take a posture of prayer, however that looks for you. Whether that is bowing your head or closing your eyes or just sitting there quietly before the Lord. Let me pray with you and pray for you, please. So Father, God, only you as the great God is and loving and merciful God that you are. Who is so intent on being part of our lives and being touchable for us that you put the story of Jephthah in the book of Judges for us today. God, a man who loves you, but yet makes great, tragic decisions in his life. Yet, God, you work through him. And yet you mention him in the roll call of those who are greatest in faith. So, Father, today this gives us great hope through your mercy and your love in our lives that the days when we get it wrong, the moments when we struggle, those moments when we have made a bad decision, it may not erase the consequences of those things, but yet it doesn't close us off from you, Lord. That you don't turn your back on us, but that you embrace us. Because, God, we're all guilty at some point of living so close to the world that we adopt the reasoning and the thinking and the ways of the world in our lives. But, God, you are so patient. So today, let this be a moment that we focus on your character and nature and who you are today, Lord. Let this be a moment that we realize that Rescue and reign in our life go hand in hand. So God, we surrender these areas of our life that we have been holding back, maybe because of shame, maybe because of guilt. God, if you can accept Jephthah, then God, you can embrace us. So God, we surrender those things to you today. God, I give you the habit of my life, the addiction of my life, this relationship, God, this thing that I think I cannot live without, this thing that I have put equal to you, Lord, or even before you, I surrender it to you today. I give it to you. God, help me to navigate through this process of surrender in my life. Because God, if you can take Jephthah and do what you have done in his life, then you can take my brokenness and my pain and my heartache and do great things. So I surrender to you. I surrender to you. Thank you, Father. Lord, open our hearts and our minds. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord. In your name. Hey, thanks for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there so that more people have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. and we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.